friends, hello campers, and welcome back to Girls Camp, or welcome maybe for your first time. And if it is your first time, I'm so glad you're here. I hope you feel very welcome, and I hope you stay a while. I am absolutely thrilled and honored. Oh, I'm your host, Haley Rall. Did I say that? I'm Haley Rall. Hi, the host. (laughs) I am so thrilled and honored to be bringing you today's interview with Amber Fillerup. Amber is one of the most highly requested guests on Girls Camp, and I can absolutely understand why. I have followed and been inspired by Amber and her bravery and authenticity online for many, many years now. Amber, by way of formal introduction, has been an influencer for over 10 years. She started out blogging and has been influencing ever since, and she is also the founder of two very successful companies, BFB Hair and Day Hair. She grew up Mormon and has since left the church, and we get to sit down in her beautiful home and talk about her timeline, why she left Mormonism, where she has landed now, how this has all affected her as an influencer and a wife and a mother and a business person, and there is just so much wisdom and insight. When I tell you I was hanging on to her every word, I mean it, and when I went through to edit the conversation, I was just hanging on to her every word again. It is such a rich and important conversation that I cannot wait to share with you. And I'm just so grateful to Amber for being willing to come on and share her story with me and with Girls Camp. You know, they say never meet your heroes, but meeting Amber in real life, she was just as lovely and magical and smart and wise as she seems. And I'm just, again, so honored I got to have this chat with her. Speaking of chats, let's do a little campfire chat. I want to talk about last week's episode really quick because I was so scared to release that episode. I don't know why I was so in my head about it. I obviously say all sorts of things on this podcast and I am becoming increasingly comfortable to share all the things, but something about talking about temple stuff just really got in my head and I was so nervous to release that episode, but I am so glad that I did. It has been so immensely healing for me to be able to talk with you all about your temple experiences and just to connect and relate. And not only about the temple experiences specifically, but about how much the temple experiences say about our Mormon experiences generally. I don't think I was expecting it to bring up so much for so many of us, but I'm so glad that we could kind of navigate that together. And I just felt really held in the space. So thank you so much for that. I also had a lot of responses about what I shared last week around friendship dynamics and friendship changes and how devastating and difficult that can be. So one of you DM'd me and said, let's do a whole episode on it. And I absolutely agree. I very soon want to do a deep dive episode into adult friendship dynamics. And I want to talk about the faith element of that, because I know a lot of you have had to deal with friendship adjustments due to changing faith. And I think that's an important element of the conversation too. The last thing I'll say is just a tiny little recap of our trip to Phoenix. It was so much fun. It felt very, very nice to get away and enjoy some sunshine. There was a lot of work to do. We were pretty busy because I interviewed Amber and also the wonderful, amazing Emily Kaiser, whose episode will come out next Wednesday, which I'm so excited for. Emily was so much fun to talk to and she shares such a wonderful story. But it was really fun to meet Amber, meet Emily, to eat a bunch of good food, to lay by the pool when we had time, and I'm just glad that I got to have that little getaway. It was fun to see Phoenix, too. I think Phoenix is underrated. It was super cool. Bentley and I found some really cool thrift shops and then mostly just ate a bunch of food, and I loved it all. So shout out to Phoenix, Arizona. We had a great time, and I can't wait to go back. All right, that is all for today's intro, and here is the conversation with Amber Fillerup. Welcome, Amber, to Girls Camp. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. I have so much to talk to you about. We were already kind of talking earlier about all the things that I'm personally excited to hear that I know so many people are excited to hear from you. So thank you. Thank you. you. For being here. No, I was telling Haley, you guys, that... 
I never thought I would do a podcast like this because I've always been petrified to talk about this topic. Mm. But like hearing you so confidently speak on these topics has made me realize like, okay, I can talk about this too and like just be confident about it. So I feel like you're all helping us. So thank you. (laughs) You're so nice. That means seriously the world to me. But it's funny you say that because I feel like when I was starting my podcast, I looked to you as someone who I can't remember exactly how timelines lined up, but I feel like you've always been very authentic online in front of a massive audience. And I looked to women like you and was like, okay, if they're brave enough to do this, I can do my thing. And I feel like there's such a beautiful effect of like women just empowering women. Yeah, like bouncing off each other and like... Yes. Yeah. Which is so beautiful. Yeah. And yes, this topic is one that I think, obviously, as we'll talk about, just comes with a lot of things. (laughs) It's so many nuances. So many nuances. Yeah. Lots of connections, lots of strings attached to lots of different things. So I think it can be difficult to talk about, but I feel like you've been opening up more about it online from what I've seen. And I just think every time you do, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I really, I agree. It's so helpful. Yeah. So I'm appreciative of you doing that and I can't wait to get into it all. I know. I'm so excited. Let's start at the beginning. So starting out with your relationship to Mormonism growing up as a kid, as a teenager, I would just love to hear what your Mormon upbringing was like. Yeah. Growing up Mormon, honestly, it was pretty normal actually, because my mom was a convert. So my dad baptized her when I think she was like 15 or 16 and they were high school sweethearts. They're still like adorably in love. Mm. Her having been a non-member, I think made her so much more open-minded And I grew up in Mesa, Arizona, just for reference, which is basically like a mini Provo. Like at the time it was, I felt like it was all Mormons surrounding Mm. us. So very heavily influenced by Mormon culture. But my parents were pretty, like they weren't super hardcore in any specific area of Mormonism. We were able to wear bikinis or if we would travel, we could go in the ocean on Sundays. But I remember other families not being able to go in the ocean. They can't swim on Sundays or whatever. So they were pretty relaxed about a lot of things. And then we also had my mom's parents, which weren't Mormon, and then her sister. So we always saw them drinking at family gatherings and we would go to like their Lutheran church. I don't know, just different things like that. So I feel like I was exposed to a lot more than Mormonism, which helped so much. That makes a big big difference. Yes, totally. And then like her second cousins were Jewish. So we would go to Jewish weddings and seeing all of that definitely helped me stay more grounded, I Mm -hmm. think, which was good. Just comparing my own experience, Mormonism was like the only thing. Everything else was other. It sounds like you had more of a mindset of like, this is my thing. This is what we do, but it's not necessarily what everybody does. Well, that's what was confusing, I think, because at home, that was very much the thought and sentiment. But then you go to church and hear all the things like you can only find true happiness through the Mormon church and just conflicting thoughts where then you start to be like, well, wait, but they're so successful and happy. And, you know, so how does that make sense? Totally. So yeah, I think that part was definitely confusing. And it was more, as I've reflected on it, a lot of my confusion with the church did come from cultural things and like community Mm. and not necessarily at home. Our church growing up, the standards were so high for kids and like specifically teens. One little thing I remember is being in high school and like certain kids who were like the good Mormon kids, when they would come up and talk to me, it was this feeling of like, wait, why are you talking oh, to me? Really? And not from a perspective, like a mean perspective, but literally like I'm not worthy to be in your presence. Oh, like I'm like a bad Mormon. You're a good Mormon. Are we even allowed to talk? Like mm-hmm. I always just felt like there was this disconnect between me and other Mormons because I do feel like I embraced my sexuality from a young age and always had a hard time with that. Why am I feeling drawn to exploring these things and other people aren't so Mm -hmm. that was always very confusing for me yeah that's such a good point because even if you're seeing 
other people living differently. You're going to church and hearing, we're the ones that have the truth. We are the right ones. They're not truly happy, which is really confusing and hard, especially if you're like, they seem happy, right? I want to get into more of that cultural dynamic with like the good Mormons and the bad Mormons. Can you tell me more about what that was like for you growing up? That sounds like it would feel really hard. Did it make you feel insecure? What, What did it feel like? Like I said, I definitely always knew, like I got called a slut a lot. Mm. And I remember feeling like, yes, like I am that. I almost like identified as that in certain ways. And it was just like very confusing. Like I always, even as an adult, would tell people, yeah, I was just a hard kid. I was just the hard kid to raise in Mm. the Mormon church. But now I'm like, oh my gosh, I was actually such a good kid. Like always home for curfew. I knew how to work hard. I was super creative. And I've been able to kind of go back and like reframe how I thought about myself then. Oh, I love that. But at the time, yeah, I definitely felt like I knew I was the bad Mormon. When we would go do baptisms for the dead, I'd have to tell him like, sorry, I'm on my period. I can't go. When really I'm like giving my boyfriend a hand job. Yeah. <laughs> like, and you like were told that you couldn't yeah. go. So yeah. I'd have to like go home and like be so embarrassed yeah. or like do the whole bishop thing where they would tell you you can't have the sacrament for a month. And then you're just like so embarrassed, like in front of my siblings, not taking the sacrament. That was a big deal. So I think it was just all those things that I always just felt like I was something was like deeply wrong with me, Mm. even with. And I know this is kind of a people get like uncomfy with this topic, but like even with masturbation, (laughs) like I remember feeling like something was so wrong with me. Like I was so embarrassed by that. That's something like with my kids, I want to teach them that is completely normal. And not only is it completely normal, but it's so healthy. Yes. And like something you absolutely need to explore Mm -hmm. before you even think about doing something with someone else totally so yeah I think it's just those topics that no one ever talked about and therefore you're just like left to your own imagination like what to do with that you know totally and like what that means about you and what it means about your worth and your goodness yeah I so appreciate you speaking to that it's so sad that things that are perfectly normal and healthy like you just said are so steeped in shame yeah and it takes a long time to unravel that and I think that's really beautiful that you're able to now say oh I you know want something different for my kids yeah the biggest point of dissonance it sounds like for you or the biggest kind of rub against Mormonism was the sexual shame stuff yeah for sure and do you feel like you were being called a slut because people knew like oh she's giving her boyfriend a hand job or was it because of the way you were dressing like where did that narrative come from about you I think it was both honestly looking back I kind of almost wished we had social media at the time because I do think there could have been a level of like, yeah, I gave him a hand job. Like, so what? Just own it and yeah. like back up, yeah. you know? So I do kind of wish I like had that tool just to kind of have that power over my life. At the time, you were kind of just in the hands of rumors and things spreading. And oh my gosh, we had just the most toxic moms, which I hope they're listening to. (laughs) They probably are. (laughs) We had like the most toxic moms in our community. And so, so many of the rumors would come from the moms. There was like a group of like cool moms. They thought they were the cool moms. And they had wealth and they had status in the church and all these things yeah like my friends would tell me oh I was over at so-and-so's house and I heard the moms talking and they were saying this and so I always was just so confused by that what do you mean the mom was like that was so confusing for me and so yeah I wrote an email to one of the moms basically just saying what you're saying is so harmful and it's harming me. And it's also just not true. They always say rumors have like some element of truth to them. And I'm like, I know firsthand they don't always. Yeah. My boyfriend came home from his mission early and the moms went crazy saying I was pregnant and all these different things. And I remember just being so upset that I was the one who was left to feel like I did something wrong. You know, shortly after he did end up getting help for the things that he was struggling with. Mm. But I'm like, but it was blamed on you. It was blamed on me. So 
I definitely took like I or felt like I took a lot of the heat for those types of scenarios. Yeah, that's so awful to feel that way. Yeah. Especially from other women in your community, from women that should be the people guiding you and loving you and nurturing you. I feel like what's so bad about it to me, one of the things that's so bad about it to me is that they probably disguised it as, oh, we care about Amber Mm -hmm. and we want Amber to be sexually pure. And like, can you believe Amber this and Amber that? And they probably felt justified in doing that because they were caring about you. But it's that's not it's not totally. coming from a place of care. Yes. And you can feel that yes. when it's about you. Totally. And I felt true care. My dad, for example, I came home from drinking with my friends one night mm. and they always had me come into their room and say goodnight to them. I had the like Reese's pieces before I went in there, whatever the trick was at the time. <laughs> but like I knew they knew. And he asked me to go to a baseball game with him. And while we were there, he's like, okay, so I know you've been trying some alcohol. Like, tell me how it is. And like, he just had a conversation about it. And I'll never forget that because to me, that felt like true love and like care. Him just not being judgmental, just genuinely wanting to know how my experience was and like how I'm feeling. Yeah. And so I'm like so grateful he did that because despite all the like, messy things that happened with community I did feel like that's how it things should be handled good you know so you feel like in your home there wasn't that same shame and judgment yeah for the most part I think my parents struggled with other members would send them things a lot so like when I was in college I did some modeling when you're modeling there is an element of like you kind of do what you're told a little bit you're executing someone's vision you know what I mean so I had to wear this wife beater and these like short shorts I was posing with a guy and someone saw the photos now looking back I'm like oh are you kidding me like I would post those Is it today so mild? as if it's you nothing sh- you should post them I know I should <laughs> I find see. them <laughs> but someone sent them to my mom and was like I am horrified. I thought you would be too. Like you need to see these. I do see how as a mom, that would be so confusing. Like on the one hand, it's like your peers who are essentially telling you like you need to be ashamed of this. So I do think sometimes they maybe fell into doing what they felt like the community wanted them to do, Mm. which was be upset with me for that. But for the most part, they were super chill about Like I would always leave the house in like the tiniest short shorts and like they didn't care. They never said anything. And like, I'm so grateful because I am so comfortable with my body and like always have been. Yeah. So I'm so, so grateful for that. Yeah. That's amazing. It's nice to have that level of safety in the home. And yeah, like you said, probably not perfectly all the time, but not to the level of toxicity of that com- that community policing is that's really intense it is that's yeah. really intense and just so unnecessary it's like, so unnecessary yeah. when I was dating this guy I was probably 15 my friend's mom was in the ward of my boyfriend's mom okay and she walked over to my boyfriend's mom's house and knocked on the door and said hey I'm really worried that so-and-so is dating Haley have you seen what she wears she wears short shorts And then my boyfriend texted me and was like, hey, don't ever wear shorts to my house. Like it became this huge thing. When grown women are speaking about you and how you choose to dress your own body as a teenager, there's something really, really damaging about that. And I remember thinking that same thing. I just wanted to say I, I felt that too, where it's like, is this the only thing you have to worry about? Do you not care if I'm a good person? Do you not care what I care about, what I think about, what I have to offer is Mm -hmm. literally the only thing you care about the shorts that I'm wearing or that I, you know, made out with so-and-so. It felt so damaging to feel like that was what was being prioritized in the community when there's so many more important things. Totally. Why are we not talking about the fact that I ran for student council and won or that I like started a club and was president of a club like why aren't we talking about those things why are we so focused on me making out with my boyfriend who I've been with for three years exactly it's just so petty and silly absolutely and like could be done in such a more healthy way where it would empower the girls instead of making them feel like 
I don't know. They're going to do it anyway. That's I did it thing. anyway. <laughs> oh, we're, they're going to do it anyway. Yeah. It never helped. It just made us feel really terrible about yeah. it, which again, doesn't help. If anything, I think it makes it worse. Yeah. Yeah. I totally feel that too. Thanks for sharing all of that. Let's talk about your college years leading up to meeting David, what it was like once you left high school, what was happening for you with religion. Yeah, college years, I was like, I am piecing out of here and never coming back. So I fully had the mentality of I am leaving this place and I don't want to see anybody here ever again. I had a ton of resentment just with the whole community. Yeah, makes sense. So I was so excited to leave. I'm a fairly independent sort of free spirit anyway. So I think that was where I finally felt like, oh, like this is how I'm meant to live, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like I was always begging my parents to send me off to boarding school. And like, I just always craved that independence. So that's when I feel like I started to try to figure out what does the church even mean to me? And at one point I remember being like, when I read the scriptures, I totally tune out. I don't take in or an, and absorb anything, honestly. And so I was like, I'm going to really make an effort and like try to learn about these people. So I started making these flashcards for, for the scriptures. <laughs> yeah, flashcards. <laughs> so I'm like sitting there in my dorm room or whatever apartment making these flashcards about like all the scripture people. Even that didn't work. I'm like, I still just feel like I have this like disconnect where I'm like, why can't I feel like I care enough, I guess? Yeah. Um, Even trying really hard, making flashcards, like being like, I'm going <laughs> to give this by all. Like, I love yes. That. Yes. There was still always kind of that disconnect for me where I just felt like I'm a part of the community, but also not like I feel like I'm on the outside a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I met David in Utah. We met at the gym, but I think we had a pretty normal dating experience as far as like a Mormon dating experiences go. How long did you date each other? We dated for about a year and then I kind of gave him an ultimatum. Mm. Toxic of me. You were like, marry me or? <laughs> well, I was like, let's be official yeah. or like I want to date other people. Yeah. I was like 21, I think. Okay. And so I also felt like so much pressure to get married, which is probably why I was like giving an ultimatum. Mm -hmm. Because I was definitely the last of my friend group yeah. to get married. Yeah. Crazy as it is, that's older, I yeah. would say. For sure. Yeah. You went to college in Utah. Did college bring you to Utah? I went to UVU at first. And then I can't remember if I like fully transferred to BYU. Or I think like people who couldn't get into BYU like mm. did spring and summer yes. or something. Mm -hmm. Somehow I was at BYU. Got without it. ever getting accepted. Like the spring, summer <laughs> yes, workaround. Yes, I do. Yes, I you do remember I mean? that. Uh huh. So I was doing classes there, but just felt like I cannot get myself excited about this. This feels like it's not for me. So then I went to hair school. Got and it. that's when I was like, this is it. Like I found this my is, thing. yes, I found Amazing. my thing, like found my happiness. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Okay. So then you're in Utah, you meet David. I'm curious if being in Utah as a Mormon, it sounds like you were trying to kind of figure it out, like maybe noticing this doesn't completely feel like it's doing that much for me. And at that time you were in Utah, which is intensely Mormon. So I'm curious kind of what was happening during that time period. It sounds like you were trying to figure out doctrinal stuff. Was there cultural stuff going on or where would you say you were at? I mean, I wish I thought more about it, honestly, but I think it's so laid out for you as a teenager in Mormon culture. You're going to go to college. I mean, if that as a woman, it's like true. maybe to meet a guy, yeah, go to college, <laughs> <laughs> but like you're going to meet someone, you're going to get married, have kids. And so I, I never really like thought about anything more because I was just like, that's my path. I just have to find a guy and like the rest will work itself out, I guess. Yeah, that's so, what we do. Yeah. yeah, totally. So I like wish I put more thought into it all, but I honestly can't say I did. So many of my thoughts at the time in those years was like how to meet guys, how to impress guys, all those things. Totally. And so, it makes a lot of sense. I feel like I relate where it's so expected. You kind of just go to church and try and date and I think that speaks to, I've never really thought about it this way until you said that, but I think it speaks to the power of having these kind of goalposts in Mormonism where the church I think is really good at being like, just focus on getting married or yes. just focus on getting on a mission. And you kind of don't worry 
as much about the other things mm-hmm. because you're focused on, okay, this is my next thing that I'm supposed to do. It's what everybody is doing. Yeah. And that takes up a lot of mental energy and just time. And it kind of puts you in an element of like, just coast till you get there. And then it's like, well, then what? Like life is so much more than just like being married or like mm. having kids, mm. which I'm so grateful that I, I just wanted to have kids. I craved being a mother since I was like as young as I can remember. Mm. But that was one of my biggest things when I had kids was like, I don't want my kids to ever learn that like their purpose in life is to have a family. I would be so thrilled if my kids grew up and like just decided their whole passion is traveling the world and like being adventurers or starting a nonprofit or like being a teacher and just like never having a family of their own if that's what made them happy. And so I always struggled with that was sort of like the first thing I would think about is like our purpose, literally the purpose that is taught to you in order to get to heaven is to have a family. And as a kid, even like, do you remember Sherry do? Yes. I loved Sherry do, yeah. but she wasn't married. And oh, I was always I like, God about that. So is she not going to heaven? Yeah. Like I seriously was so confused by that. I'm like, but she's so incredible. I don't understand how will she not get in. (laughs) Yeah, she was like the only single woman that I remember Mm -hmm. ever really learning about or from in the church. And it was a huge deal that she was single. And I remember thinking that too and thinking, oh, I guess she'll just get married in heaven. Like she'll have her chance. Yeah. But it was a really, really uncommon to the point where that was the only person. It was very uncommon that there were any women to look up to in the church that were not married yeah and mothers too and unfortunately if I'm being honest I wasn't I wasn't I wish I would have been inspired by that instead it like made me scared for her totally (laughs) you know I was like oh my gosh like you got to find someone yes um it almost felt like the caveat like Sherry do there's these wonderful things but it was like oh but like she's not married yes exactly oh I forgot about her that's so interesting yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense though you were in Utah going to school, you're probably busy too, but you were like, I want to get married. Yeah. You met David, dated for a year, gave the Mm -hmm. ultimatum, and then you ended up getting married. So tell me about that phase of your life, being married, starting to have children. And I'm curious too, where the influencing aspect comes into this and the the business, because you're a very successful influencer. You have a successful business now, multiple. When did that start? And how did that connect in in those years for you as as a wife and as a mother? I started influencing even before I met David. I don't know if it was growing up Mormon and always being told like we need a journal and document. And I actually think the OG, OG bloggers were Mormons, like with their blog spots and they would share their recipes Mm. and family trips and stuff I always remembered that like seeing Mormon families have these blogs and so I decided to start one when I was going to Fiji for a trip and wanted to document that so yeah I kind of started influencing even before I met David and would talk about like bad dates I went on and just anything it was truly my journal yeah cool and then when I met David He was surprisingly one of the only people I had met that wasn't embarrassed by it because at the time it was very cringe to like be doing that. Uh It was not the normal thing to be taking a selfie. People didn't really even know what the term selfie was. Yeah. So I don't like I don't think there was a term for it yet is what I meant. Anyway, so he I always loved that he just fully embraced that. He thought it was so cool. And like he's always been the type where it doesn't matter if everyone is saying one thing like he really thinks for himself Mm -hmm. I guess he always encouraged my blog when we got married I would say the thing that played into it was obviously our temple marriage yeah and I remember I'm like kind of hopping all over the place it's great but (laughs) chronology is too hard with this stuff so I I don't even worry about it I don't know where I am (laughs) in my timeline okay marriage my mom took me to go get my temple dress I remember just sobbing, having a full on anxiety attack about, I didn't know what at the time I was like freaking out thinking like, am I not supposed to marry David? Am Mm. I like, what is going on? I honestly think I was just so devastated in that moment that like I always pictured my wedding and then you don't even know what you're going to wear until you go try on your temple dress. And then you're like, and you're like, um, I have no choice in the matter. Like, this is just what I have to wear. 
And it sounds so petty, but I am super into fashion. I've always collected magazines. I've loved following trends since I was a young girl. So like that was honestly a devastating moment for me to be like, I have to wear this. I don't want to. And honestly, if I'm being totally honest with myself at the time, like I didn't even care to get married in the temple. I was Mm. truly, I think, doing it just because it was like the thing you're supposed to do. And I didn't see any other option as a possibility for me. So I'm like, I guess I'm going to do it. This is what I have to do. And this is what I have to wear. Yes. Yes. It's crazy because I went through the temple before I went on a mission. So you have more time to kind of like mentally adjust (laughs) to how crazy it can feel, at least how crazy it felt for me. But when you're getting married, I just feel like it happens more quickly because it's like, you're getting married, you're planning a wedding. And then it's like, okay, this is what the temple is. And this is what you have to wear. And at that point, like you said, it's like, you want to get married. You want to marry this yeah. person you love. So you're like, I guess this is just how I do it. This, this is just what I do. Yeah. How was your temple wedding? I honestly feel like I spaced it all out. Like, I don't know if I was like dissociating the whole time, but yeah. I think I was mostly just like sweet. I'm like stoked to be married. Great. But like, yeah. I even remember not the ceiling part, but the part before I fell asleep and David like nudged me. Like I was just, <laughs> I don't want to act like I was, I wasn't super interested in it. I was just interested in getting married, which like, that's all you should be interested in at that point. Like, Absolutely. let's be honest. Yeah. I I just remember being stoked to be married and that's it and being bummed about the rest and trying just like to get over it. Yeah, I can totally relate. It's kind of just like, well, I guess this is what we do, but at least I'm married and can like move on from there. Totally. Yeah, that makes so much sense. What would you say if you could characterize your relationship with David and I'm sure it's changed so much because how long have you been married now? How many years? Um, It'll be 11 years or no, I think we have been married 11 years. So it'll be 12 years yeah. soon. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm curious how you would characterize maybe in those early days too, how much was Mormonism like a part of your relationship and, you know, you got married in the temple. Was it a big connection point for you too or, or not so much? I don't think so much. And I'm so grateful actually, especially since we've both left now. Yeah. I think we're both pretty creative. We love traveling. So I think we connected on many more things. Like we never really talked about church. We went together, I guess, but we weren't like reading scriptures together, praying together, any of that. It's not really my personality to do that anyway. Like we would go to the park and like read other books together, but Mm. just not like it was never like a spiritual thing together. And I feel like we've definitely grown together spiritually without the Mormon aspect over the last 11 years but I don't think it played like a huge role in our marriage honestly which is really nice yeah yeah especially now yeah Yeah, because I can definitely see how you could grow apart really easily if that is the main thing totally yeah and then you change on that yeah I think that's really cool too because I do know a lot of couples that often is kind of the glue a lot of times. And then if one or both have a faith crisis or transition, you kind of have to figure out what else is holding us together. Yeah. So I think that's really beautiful that you were able to, I mean, you had that in common to an extent, but that it wasn't, Yeah. maybe it wasn't as big of a deal, which is really cool. I'm curious with the influencing aspect, while you were married and started having children, that is a very different non-traditional way to be in a marriage because you were working. And I'm curious if you could speak to being an influencer while you were still Mormon and while you were a mother, kind of what that was like for you, what the response of the Mormon community was, what the response of maybe the greater community was. So from day one, like having garments was super hard for me, really, really hard for me. And I remember I did this photo shoot, which I'll have to send you the photos so Please. everyone can see because Please. it's hilarious So I did this photo shoot and posted it. And honestly, when I posted it, I had no reservations posting it. I was like so stoked with how it turned out, all these things. And I just got destroyed because I wore short shorts for it. But in my mind, I was always like, well, I'm working. Jimmer, Utah's God can 
doesn't have to wear his garments when he's working. Is he a slut too? Yeah, Are we both honestly. Sluts together? <laughs> um, Jimmer. Jimmer's so a slut too. I love Jimmer. <laughs> Jimmer's our fellow slut. Um, anyway, so I was just floored, like really genuinely taken back by the response. And I think that's the first time I can remember being like gut punched by the community where I'm like, oh, ouch, that hurts. I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. And now I'm made to feel again, like I'm just, I should be embarrassed and like shameful about this thing. And that would continue for the next however long. Oh, at one point I even got a letter from a neighbor that said my in-laws, they said brother and sister Clark must be so embarrassed and disappointed to have you as a daughter-in-law. I remember like ripping that up. I was like, David cannot see this. Cause you start to feel like, does everyone think this or is this an isolated opinion? I was still so young. So like, I didn't have the confidence in myself to be like, whatever. I yeah. Don't care to be like, you. you're out of line. Yeah. yeah. Why were they saying he should be embarrassed about what you were wearing mm-hmm. online specifically? Yeah. And I'm, I'm definitely the type where like, if I know someone's mad about something, I do like to mess with them a little bit I can't say I wouldn't sometimes not wear garments just to like Mm -hmm. poke the better a a little (laughs) yeah like I have fun with that a little bit good as you should and David was always from day one like I'm so grateful that he he never made me feel bad about it ever he was always like do what feels best for you he's always made me feel very free to question whatever I wanted or take a step back or whatever and then obviously like he was going through it with me too he was equally as offended by all the comments and stuff so we were kind of both dealing with that together but then fast forward we lived in New York and New York was amazing because that was our first experience where in Relief Society they would pray to Heavenly Mother and people would voice concerns with the church and They would wear pantsuits. They would talk about their frustrations with the church's stance on gay marriage. And I had never heard anyone question anything in church. For me, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Like I have always had these questions, but like I didn't know I could say them out loud in this setting. Mm -hmm. And so I just felt like I have found my place. Like these are my people. I love that I can learn and grow from them, I guess, instead of feeling like I have to be this like cookie cutter Mormon. And so I was just telling David about like how I just feel so like I'm in the right place right now. We were supposed to come to New York, whatever. And then I got on these forums. I don't get on them anymore, but at the time I would get on them and read what people were saying about me. Yeah. And someone got on and was like, okay, here's all the deets. I'm in the Clark's ward in New York David gave a talk. It was about this. They were like nitpicking the talk. They're like, Amber comes to church every day dressed like she's going to go. I think they said like into Broadway or something. Oh, gosh. Um, Anyway, like they would give updates every Sunday. And so I think what people don't understand is like when you're in that scenario, it's anonymous. So you don't know who said it. So when you go to church, you're thinking, was it you? Was it you? You're kind of on edge around everybody at that point because you're like I don't know who's doing this and so I kind of looked at everybody like are you my friend or are you not my friend can I actually trust you and then it got to the point where I'm like I don't I'll never say another prayer in church again I don't want it to be nitpicked I'm not going to say yes to any talks I'm not going to give lessons because I was just too insecure if they were to go report on what I said like yeah anyway so that totally effed with me really really bad it was almost like my final straw where I'm like I'm just done with being a part of this community I don't want to say that I'm in the same community as these people who think it's okay to like say that and do these kinds of things so I think that was sort of where it all started to unravel yeah honestly Uh, it's so hurtful you felt like you found a place where you could feel safe yeah. And they were treating you to your face as if you were safe and welcome to be yourself and to show up as who you are. Yeah. But you weren't. But it's not the case. But it wasn't the case. And I can't imagine how that feels to just encounter that stuff online anyway, but especially to know, like you were saying, wait, these are the people I'm sitting amongst and we're supposed to be sharing these vulnerable things about what we believe and what's hard for us. And yeah. you were being vulnerable and showing up in those spaces and participating and then just to 
figure out that that's what was actually going on is so sad. I know. Yeah, it was a big bummer. I bet. I'm sorry. That's really shitty, honestly. It just feels really, really sad to me that people feel like they have the right just to speak that way about anybody, especially in the context of like, we are churchgoers together. We are members of a faith community that ultimately at its core should be about being good, kind people. Yeah. And it sounds like that's what it was challenging for you is like, is that really the case? Because now you've seen in your community growing up as a teenager with the moms, and then you're seeing this in New York as an adult with your fellow peers. And it's like, the community was not doing what it should do, which is be loving and kind. And that would be really hard to be on the receiving end of. Well, and I can see how someone who doesn't have a following, they just are in their ward and those are the only people that they associate with. I can see how you could have a lovely Mormon experience, honestly, if you have a good ward. But unfortunately, once you bring in social media, it's almost like you're a focus group for the entire church as a whole. And you are getting, while in your ward, you might have two toxic people, two toxic people from each ward are coming at you all at once. It's almost impossible to have like an isolated good experience just because you're getting everything from everywhere. And honestly, like if I look at just my community, here I totally could have thrived with all like they're just incredible people and like even when we told them that we had left and I try to bring it up very casually and like confidently because it is a happy thing for us that we left but I'm sort of getting ready to hear the like oh I'm so sorry to hear and kind of gearing up for that response but I feel like our ward has done the opposite where like one person even said oh I'm so happy for you and just casually said that and I was like so taken back like you're happy for me thank you yeah it is such a happy thing yeah Yeah, I just think they are wonderful people but it just is too hard as an influencer to have a good Mormon experience that's such a good point I'm so glad you said that because I'm at the very beginning of kind of witnessing that myself where especially talking about Mormonism on the podcast often critically it's hard to not have a really negative kind of taste in my mouth about Mormons because of how incredibly cruel so many of them are toward me now. But I think it's a good counterpoint to remember that doesn't make up all of the religion by any means. But I also think it also doesn't mean that there's not something to really be considered there, that there's a religion that's emboldening people to speak that way and to behave that way and to think that way. So I I really appreciate you speaking to kind of both sides of that. And to your point, yeah, when you're doing this on a really large scale with a really large platform, you're going to see the worst of it. Yeah, you kind of can't avoid it. The worst. Totally. Totally. So I, I get when people say like, oh, that wasn't my experience. And I'm like, I'm sure it wasn't like I can totally see that. But unfortunately, this was mine. Yeah. And it's fair and valid and real. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, along with the garment thing, I think too, it started to feel less like it was just criticism and judgment towards me. And almost like I started to feel I recognized this dialogue from when I was younger. And like, my siblings would be like, well, if I'm following the rules, you have to too. And it kind of gives those vibes where it's like, no, if I'm following the rules and wearing my garments, you better too. And so it kind of gave that vibe. I don't want to do something just because we're all rule followers. You know, like I, I don't want to do it for that reason. Yes. And then I realized I'm truly just doing it so that my community will accept me. And that's ridiculous. So Mm -hmm. that's when I finally was like, okay, I'm not going to wear them. I'm just going to announce to everybody. I don't wear my garments anymore. So no one keeps giving me crap for it. Yeah. So that was kind of like where I first announced to everybody that, which an announcement unfortunately was necessary. Yeah. Or else (laughs) you're going to get a thousand DMs every time. How was that announcement received? Honestly, so good. Like it was the biggest weight lifted off of me all the comments about that disappeared. I think that's also when I realized the, just like the benefit of owning up to things like that. Like Mm. the quicker you just say it and own up to it and be confident about it, people are going to shut up. So just don't let them have the dialogue for you, like create Mm. your own. 
people want to speculate and they want to yes. wonder and they want to, oh, well, is she or is she not? And if she isn't, then what does that mean about this? And what does that mean about that? And if you can just say, no, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, shit. And what are we going to talk about now? Totally. <laughs> well, they, they find something. Yeah, so true. Then it, <laughs> then it shifted into like, oh, poor David. Like Amber's pulling him away from the church. And it kind of shifted into that, which still hasn't completely gone away. Mm. It's like apparently my fault yeah. that we left. So they definitely find something. But <laughs> so interesting. It's so interesting hearing all these themes of your story too because you think back to the boyfriend who went home from his mission like of course it's your fault of course it's the woman's fault yes and same thing happens I see all the time too with relationships where oh of course it's the woman's fault I talked with Emily last night and she talked about that with her and Brady because Mm -hmm. she was a convert and she was like everyone thinks that I led him out of the church and she shares in the episode she's like no I actually was the one that wanted to stay but for some reason it's just so convenient yes, to blame it's the so woman. <laughs> Just natural villain. Yeah, right. So, okay, so you talk about taking off your garments online. Mm-hmm. You kind of said the beginning of the end was in New York. Talk me through how you, from that point, like unraveled where was taking off the garments and announcing that. And as you kind of unraveled and transitioned, how you were choosing what and what not to share publicly, too. I did a post where I was talking about how I'm just kind of questioning everything and I'm like kind of in the middle. I don't know what's happening, but like I'm just questioning everything and I don't know what that means for me yet. And I told myself going into that, I didn't want to feel like I needed to be on a timeline just because I started questioning things I had to leave right then. Like I didn't want any outside pressures to influence this decision. I just wanted to like take my time and go at the pace I wanted to. I don't know. I think it just opened up so many more conversations with people who were like, oh, I actually feel the same way. Then I was like, oh, there's so many of us that feel this way. And then you start to feel free to explore more thoughts and thoughts that like when you when you're young and growing up Mormon, it's like doubt your doubts, not your faith. Like Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how much I heard that. Yeah. When I read the CES letter, I felt like I was doing something so bad like so dark and scary yep and now I realize how toxic that is to teach people that it's one of the most toxic things about the church honestly that they teach not to look into anything just look forward and have faith and like believe It's absolutely crazy. And I think recognizing how toxic that is, just not only in the Mormon church, but literally in any scenario, was when I fully embraced all the information. And once I did that, it was game over. I think it's almost impossible at that point to deny that the church just doesn't hold the same values. And like, even when I told my kids that, when we told our kids that we were... Like you might've noticed we haven't been going to church. We're not going to go anymore. We're kind of starting our own journey. Here's the reasons. Like we were explaining gay marriage and just that I don't want them to feel pressure to get married in general or all these things. Like in their minds, they were like, oh yeah, are you kidding? Like to them, it was like, duh, like we don't believe in that as a family. So I did love that reaction from them. Yeah, that, like really we have cool. instilled in them those values of like anyone can love anyone. And they know that in their core that like when I told them the church doesn't believe in that, they were like, yeah, why would we go? Mm. And so for me, that was like, OK, yes, we're doing the right thing. You know, <sighs> that's so beautiful because it sounds like even within the church, in some capacity, you and your family were really aligned morally and like with what you believe in and prioritize enough so that when you said oh yeah we're not going to go to church anymore it was like well yeah because we believe all these things anyway yeah I think that's a really beautiful testament to it sounds like how aligned you were as a mother that even within Mormonism which wants to tell us what to teach our kids and how to teach them it sounds like you were already doing your own thing in Mm -hmm. a way that it made it much easier for your kids to be like, oh yeah, because this is what you've already taught us to care about and to believe in and to prioritize. Yeah, that's really special. I think the information thing, I'm so glad you spoke to that because I remember reading the CES letter and feeling so dark and feeling like this is Satan because this is anti-Mormon literature when it's really truly historical fact. Yes, it's like reading a history book. It's reading a history book. (laughs) It's getting on Google and saying what happened 
what who was Joseph Smith married to? Yeah. And there's facts about it. And the power that the church holds to make people think that that is evil and wrong is really scary. It's really dangerous. Yeah. It leads to a lot of ignorance. And I'm saying that from my own experience. I'm not saying all Mormons are ignorant, but I'm saying I as a Mormon was. And it's crazy how much I gave to a church that I didn't know that much about. Yeah. Until I was willing to, like you said, embrace information that pretty quickly was like, oh, this is not what I thought it was. Yeah. Like our values just don't align. Exactly. Yeah. You realize it pretty quickly. You almost don't realize the church has those deep rooted values until you read that because in a sense, it's almost been like whitewashed like they're doing in schools with slavery and stuff. Like it's such a joke how we are like hiding information from people Mm -hmm. that we think they can't handle when like we can handle it just fine. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just probably not going to make the decision you want us to make, which is why you don't want us to have that information in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for speaking to all of that. I am curious how it has felt for you in stepping away. I feel like from what I've seen or noticed, you've started pretty recently talking about it a little bit more on Mm -hmm. the internet. I'm curious what it's been like to, talk about that publicly and how you've kind of made decisions about what to share, what not to share and why. I mean, I'm a pretty open book just in general. So at this point I am open to share anything. I definitely am hesitant based off like how I'm feeling that day because I know I have to be prepared for all the toxic messages I'm going to get. So I definitely have to be in a good headspace Mm. and So it mostly depends on that. Like if I were always in like a good headspace, I'd be like, what do you want to know? Like I've always just been an open book with Mm -hmm. everything, almost TMI. Um, Same. I love TMI girls. I know. It's like a whole (laughs) genre. It's the best. I'm like perfect. Yes. Um, But now I think like the responses are either so lovely or just make me cringe so hard. I didn't realize that the church had been telling people that when you have a friend or family member or someone who leaves to give them that I'm staying because Mm. speech. And so I've gotten a lot of those Mm. from family members and otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just like such an off-putting thing to teach members to say instead of just like, I love you no matter what. That's like literally all you need to say. It's all you One need sentence. to say. That's it. Yes. You don't need PSA, to say a long PSA thing. church PR. <laughs> yes. Like don't say anything more. We don't need to know why you're staying. And like, it's love. It's fine. Like it's, I took it and was like, that's awesome. Like yeah, that's good great. I yeah. totally respect that. But I just don't know that it's necessary in that moment to say that. Mm-hmm. Um, or helpful. It's just not going to do not. what they think it's going to do. Yeah. yeah. And then other people just saying like, I know how much you loved being involved with the youth. Like, I'm so sad for you that mm. you won't be able to do that anymore. And I'm like, what about me leaving the church says I can't be involved with my community? Like, I absolutely can still be involved with the youth in my community and absolutely will. But now I won't feel... Like I was teaching Sunday school and telling them, I think you can love whoever you want. And like, I was always worried that I'm like, (laughs) I'm going to get fired. Yeah. And I eventually resigned myself because I'm like, I just feel like I can't even teach lessons anymore at this point because I just don't agree with what I'm teaching. Yeah. So that was like a big wake up call too for me was having to teach lessons and be like, I don't buy any of this. So that too definitely like sped up the process. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's just telling, like, I have been so inspired by seeing how confident you are about all of it, because sometimes I feel like I can't be. People want to find a reason to feel sorry for you Mm. and and your new scenario. I still feel like I can have the same life I had before. Like, for example, growing up, I loved that my family did family home evening and that we had dinner at the table every night as a family and had a prayer. But like looking back, I it's not because we had a prayer. It's not because we sang a hymn. It's because we just spent time together as a family. So like we have dinner at our dinner table every single night. David cooks. We go around and say one thing we're grateful for. That's like our version of a prayer. We still do family night and like the kids get to pick the activity and like lead it all. 
they have assignments. So I feel like I can still give my family the same structure, Mm -hmm. but like instead our Sunday lessons are just things I've learned that have like expanded my mind that week that I just want to teach my kids and they don't have to be religious at all. So I don't feel like our life has been impacted at all by leaving. Mm -hmm. And I feel like people just don't understand that yet. Even with the community, like that was one reason why David was really hesitant. He didn't want to lose that. And I kept reminding him, like, we're not going to because the people we want to associate with are not going to care if we leave the church. Exactly. And if they do, they are not in our circle. Yeah. Like, period, end of story. We don't want those people in our circle. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just like recognizing all those things that like our life really doesn't have to change. Actually, it gets much easier and more exciting. I love that. The church does have a lot of good things about it, but those are not unique to the church. No. And the things that are unique to the church are the things that I find really toxic or really problematic or unethical. So you can take everything that you've learned and loved about community, about family structures, about yeah, how you relate to each other in a family setting. You can take all of that. It's not reliant on reading the Book of Mormon. It's not totally. reliant on saying a yes. specific prayer. I think people in the church, it's hard for them to imagine that. And I also think it's, I love when people speak to this because I think it's so beautiful and lovely to take those good things and try them out in new ways or implement them a little bit differently, but realize, oh, all these things I loved, I still can do. I still have. The church does not own family home evening. No, the church does not not own community. There's so many things that we're so used to being connected to the church that it's nice to remember like, no, none of that was ever unique to the church. And if anything, it's like, cool, I can take that from my upbringing and apply it in a different way. Totally. Yeah. Like we've been toying around with the idea of instead calling it family magic night. And it's like, a night where the kids have to plan something and there just has to be an element of magic to it. So like if we're playing soccer as a family, maybe we like jump in the pool in our clothes after, or like maybe we have a dance to Taylor Swift, but like Rosie gets to pick if we all wear pink or like sparkles or whatever. It just has to be something silly and fun. Yeah. It's not unique to Mormon community to have traditions And just like structure, you know, totally. So totally. I want to talk more. I know you said some people asked this when you put up a question box about parenting post-Mormon. Yeah. And I think you are universally inspiring as a mother. You inspire me deeply. And even just hearing about a magic night is so special. I'm like, please, can I come? That sounds amazing. (laughs) I see in you as a very outside observer, but this really unique, just kind of lust for life. And it's really cool because I think Mormonism, at least for me, kind of reined it in almost. It's like, no, this is the way we do things. This is the way we talk about the magic of the universe. This is the way we relate to, yeah, I just love the word magic. But Mormonism had these like formulas for that. And I see in you and I sense from you just this kind of really expansive, abundant way of looking at life and of putting that into your family culture. And I just think that's so beautiful because it feels like you kind of have free reign now, right? Yes. And that's so fun and it's so, so freeing. It's so exciting. Yes. Yeah. That's why when people say like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, this is like a really fun, exciting thing for me. Yeah. I think Mormonism can kind of be a crutch for people where it does kind of rein you in like you were saying where you don't feel free to just let your mind wander and expand and like before I would have never contemplated the magic of the desert but then I'm like I've been reading all these books about just how spiritual the desert is and like all these tales and stories about the desert and the animals and I mean even just like old Native American history and the stories Mm. they believe and the rituals like all of that is so magical and cool and so now even when I'm in the desert it has like a whole new meaning meaning to me where I'm like oh I see a coyote like maybe that's like a sign of something instead of just being like oh scary coyote move on with life it's like I don't know, like everything can almost take on a new meaning, Mm -hmm. which is so cool to me. And just as we travel as a family, just taking little bits of what we learn from different cultures and like 
adopting that into our own life. And I would love if like my kids grew up and they were just a hodgepodge of beliefs that they heard from other people or saw from other cultures. But yeah, I think it just allows you to be like, I don't know, like how can I make life like the most magical totally. possible? You know? Yes. In yeah. ways that feel good and makes that feel good for the moment too. Like yeah. you're saying, I love that concept of pulling from different cultures and theologies and spiritual modalities and just being like, what feels right? What feels nice? You were talking about this earlier with reincarnation because you were saying Rosie was asking you about yeah. that. And how lovely to be like, maybe that's it. Yeah. Let's talk about it. What what would we want to be? Or why do you like that idea? That's so lovely and beautiful. And I think helpful for kids too, to be able to learn like, oh, this idea resonated with me. And now I have permission to just explore that idea mm -hmm. and think about what that idea means. And it doesn't have to be right or wrong. There doesn't have to be proof of it. There doesn't have to be a spiritual authority telling you just to give children that permission and yourself as an adult, that permission is so wonderful. Yeah. I know it's so fun because we were talking about how it, how we got on that topic was we were going over Taylor Swift lyrics and I was mm. telling her my theory. Well, many people have this theory that bigger than the whole sky is about her having a miscarriage, mm. which then led to her asking what a miscarriage is and like why I think that's so we are going like line by line and she talks about how I can't even remember the line now something about like a bird flying over Japan and like kind of hints at what I think my baby who died reincarnated in this way um I'll have to find the exact lyric yeah. but um and then so we got on in the topic of reincarnation and for her that just like totally resonated she's like I love that She's like, I think I'd want to be anybody or anything, just not a fish. <laughs> and like, I think you can totally make those roles for yourself. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. And I agree. I would, uh, fish freak me out. So yeah. I'm with you, Rosie. <laughs> I love that. I yeah. love that. And I love how Taylor Swift can have these spiritual meanings or be spiritually, a, a spiritual catalyst for these conversations. Yes. Just opening it all up we can treat it all as equal too. Because I think when I was a Mormon, there was still some aspects of like, oh, I can read some poetry and that can mean something to me spiritually. I didn't feel like it was necessarily off limits, but it wasn't equal with the Book of Mormon. For sure. It wasn't equal with what President Nelson said. And to just be like, this is all coming from like humankind and the soul and to be able to pull from that and say, this is all equal. I get to choose mm -hmm. what fits, what feels right, what resonates is just such a gift. And it seems like you do such an excellent job of doing that for yourself and also passing that on to your kids. Well, it's funny. Like, I love that you said that because it is true. Like you almost feel like the spirit is something that can be felt at church in the temple or whatever, but it does somewhat feel isolated to those instances. And like when you broaden it and like expand it into literally anything can be a spiritual experience if you want it to be. If I want to like sit in the desert and like see a bunny and have that have a deeper meaning, I can have that be a spiritual experience for myself. And mm -hmm. like, it's just as kooky as all Mormon exactly. stuff. Like when you really think about <laughs> exactly. it, like everything is kooky and all religions have so much in common. Manifesting, praying, God, higher self. It's all intertwined and mm -hmm. we just call it different things. I don't know. Yeah, I just like the idea of like whatever fits with you, great. I think we can all like love and respect Jesus and like whatever. But I also think like if my kid were just incredibly inspired by Taylor Swift amazing yeah, like great look at her like you're Jesus like yeah. you know what I mean like it yeah. doesn't have to be exclusive to like one person if that person doesn't completely like resonate and inspire and that people will probably give me shit for that because it's like <laughs> I'm not like trying to diss Jesus no but, like I, I just know exactly what you're saying of like honoring and looking to more people in that same way amen like I want to like I love Lewis Hamilton and that's mm. one of the reasons why I love him because like he is the kind of person that I want to be mm. and like he's alive today like how cool and special that like I can follow him on social media and be reminded of him every time he posts I don't know I think that's also fun to kind of expand it in that way and it's not like 
like Jesus was amazing, but like also there's so many amazing people here and now and mm-hmm. anyway. that are teaching all different sorts of things that might yeah. fit better or like feel more exciting or more inspiring or more spiritual. Yeah. And that's fine. It, sh- it should be that way, right? Like it makes sense that it's that way. It makes less sense to me that there's one singular person's teachings that have to be the end all be all yes. for how everyone connects spiritually. Yeah. I love that. I want to talk about the sexual shame piece and kind of how that's come around for you. Another thing that's deeply admirable about you is that you seem very sexually liberated in your presence on social media, which is hard to do, generally speaking, and is even harder to do, I can imagine, as someone who grew up Mormon. Yeah. And with all those elements of sexual shame that you spoke to, you know, you said you felt very connected to your sexuality even growing up. I'm curious if you can speak to that, how that's shifted now leaving Mormonism, how you've worked through some of that sexual shame, found your sexual liberation, just anything you can speak to on that. Once I kind of got rid of the idea of, I don't think I identify as Mormon anymore. That definitely made me feel free to be who I think I always wanted to be as far as like, I do feel very free with my body. I think some people just like to feel sexy or like do things that like make them feel sexual. Like I saw my friend Taylor, she did a QA and a and she was, someone asked like how to get in touch with your sexuality. And she was like, one night just like grab oil and like, rub yourself down in front yeah. of the mirror, like rub your whole body in yeah. front of the mirror and like just enjoy your body. It doesn't even have to be with somebody else. Mm. It's just like about embracing like your body. And I read this book. I'm blinking on the name of it. I'll tell you so like yeah. we can tell Yeah, everyone. I can put it in the show notes. That definitely opened my eyes to embracing my sexuality. And David read it too with me. But like in it, she talks about getting a mirror and like looking at your body part. She's like, you'd be shocked how many women have never seen. Yeah. Their own (laughs) vulva. Yeah, totally. So like get a mirror and look at it and love it. And like that's yours. And Mm. it's funny because I actually was just getting laser hair removal. And the girl, she was doing my Brazilian. Mm -hmm. And I'm like you don't have to be timid. Like I want it all gone. So like get in there. Yeah. Go to town. (laughs) (laughs) And she was like, I love that you say that. She's like, girls are always so timid when they come in here. But she said her mom, when she was younger, gave her a mirror, did that exact Mm. same thing that they say to do in the book. And she's like, look at it. And she's like, that's your best friend. And I'm like, I love that because I do feel like growing up, it was this even outside of Mormon culture, but like that song roses. Oh, uh uh-huh. Yeah. Like I feel like it was, I always remember guys being like, oh, what is, it smells like a fish market in Mm -hmm. here. And just like making jokes about it. Oh yeah. When like, they're probably secretly looking at porn. Oh, a hundred percent. And jacking off to it. So like, it's just so effed up when you think about it. But then they make you feel embarrassed to literally own a vagina as part of your body. thing that they (laughs) want want and get off on. Like, give me a break. Mm Mm-hmm. So I definitely just want to be like open about all those nuances to my girls. And like, if a guy makes a joke like that, that is not okay. And like, you can put him in his place Mm -hmm. and like, here's some one liners you can say. Yeah. And like, just have open dialogue about that kind of thing, because I don't want them to grow up thinking like, oh, it smells or it's ugly or it's gross. And some of the things that I feel like I grew up with just Mm -hmm. because of immature boys. Mm -hmm. So I think that book definitely kind of helped me get there mentally and then after that it was just like a domino effect of just feeling like oh I can just enjoy sex from like my point of view and not even I think as women we have sex and in a way are thinking about them the whole time Mm -hmm. and like what can I do to please them and men don't need any help yeah, they'll they'll get They're there. Just sign. They will get there. <laughs> if anything, we need to slow them down. Yes. So like, it's just about thinking about like yourself. Turn yourself on. Have the experience be for you, and let them have the experience be for them. Both of you be selfish in that moment and mm-hmm. just enjoy it. I think that was definitely like a turning point for David and I because it it felt so much more fun and like freeing, and it took the resentment out of it where it was like. It's not all about him, even like on a subconscious level. 
so yeah, I don't know. It's just been like fun and exciting to like read different things, hear others' experiences and like try different things like Taylor said, like grab oil and like rub yourself down in front of a mirror and like just look at your body and feel it. Yeah. <laughs> Get comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah. Like I love that. I love that too. I so appreciate you speaking to that because it's crazy how radical it almost feels to speak to that when it's really not it no. shouldn't be a radical concept no. to enjoy yourself and to be connected to yourself sexually and to have sex for your own pleasure ultimately, yeah. but it feels kind of radical it and it does. feels really radical to speak to that, but it's so important because I think one of the most long lasting harmful effects, at least for me of Mormonism has been shame around sex, shame around my own body. I think one of the best ways to to work through that is to share with other women and to talk about it with other women and realize like, oh, there's other ways to relate to myself and to my body. Yeah. And it's not evil and wrong because for a long time, the rhetoric around sex was that is literally evil and wrong and you can't take the sacrament. And everyone's going to know and you're going to be shamed. And it can be very difficult to change how our brain views those things. So yeah. I think that's really really wonderful and also practical advice about how you can push back against that. And I appreciate it because I feel like, yeah, there's just, when you have to go to Bishop's offices, as it sounds like you did too, and tell them about the hand job you gave your boyfriend, like that shit sticks with you yes. and it affects your brain and it affects how you view sex and yourself as a sexual being. So it's a really big deal and really important to yeah undo that and it doesn't just happen when you leave Mormonism like it takes effort I think and I think those are really good things that people can can do and try if they find themselves yeah. in that spot yeah for sure well and also just like there's such a massive disconnect between what and I'm completely generalizing I am going to generalize for the sake of having an easier conversation yes. but I think like guys see porn from a very young age and Mormon girls don't like I didn't see a true porn I thought porn was like a Victoria's Secret catalog truly mm -hmm. um catalog actually <laughs> I didn't see catalog <laughs> magazine it sounded right to me <laughs> um anyway but like guys see it from a young age I remember just like having that shoved down my throat guys look at porn and if they do, your marriage will be over. Like, I remember talking to my friends and being like, oh my gosh, if our husbands look at porn, like we have to divorce them. Yeah. And like, it was the end all be all. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's, first of all, so crazy, crazy that they teach that not only to guys, but also to us, but like, especially to the guys, because I feel like so many guys growing up like now I can see how hiding it for them was everything and that just creates a really toxic environment for them like mm -hmm. I would never want my son to feel like it's normal to want to look at it mm -hmm. and I read this book that talked about a porn immersion program where they took kids who had already seen porn I believe and they gave them information about porn the rates of sex trafficking consent all the things like the nasty sides of it mm -hmm. and very not even about it's wrong morally but just all the reasons outside of moral reasons yeah, why just it's ethically. wrong uh -huh. ethically wrong or can be and then they pulled them after and said like how likely would you be to look at it again and they said why well, would not look at it again or they would say that I would be much more thoughtful about the types of porn I'm watching. Not only do studies show that teaching kids about porn is so much more beneficial for a healthy relationship, I just, yeah, me and David really had a hard time with the idea of like teaching our kids that like porn is bad because God's gonna be mad at you or anything, sex, drinking, anything. It's like, no, we want you to be safe and we want you to have a healthy sexual experience for your human experience and like we want it to be the best sexual experience possible and like here's how to do that but drilling into their brains so like if you watch porn your marriage is going to be over you're going to hell like that is just not the way to do it it's not the way to do it no it doesn't work a as we were saying before with people telling us in high school yeah don't dry hump your boyfriend I did it anyway <laughs> yes. it doesn't work and doesn't. also to your point it doesn't give credit where credit is due. Kids are smart. And if you inform them and educate them, and this is another thing that really pisses me off about the Mormon church is like, 
I was smarter than you gave me credit for. And you withheld information and education from me. And I could have made smarter, better, more informed decisions, even as a kid, even as a teenager. And it sounds like that sounds like a really high priority for you and for David is information, education. And you see, A, that works better. And B, I just think it's so much kinder and more respectful yes, to kids. Absolutely. Like I gave this analogy on my Instagram a long time ago, and apparently sex analogies are like a no-no, <laughs> but for me, analogies are everything. <laughs> but I was saying how like when Rosie is at the age where like it's appropriate to have this conversation, like I would more so look at it like if she were to go on a trip, say the trip is sex. Like, yeah. I want to know who you're going with. I want to mm. help you pack. I want to help you be safe. Like if the airline screwed you over, I would want to help you like deal with that. Yeah. And like, I want you to have like the best experience possible. Like maybe there's vaccinations you need or Seriously. Like, things you need to pack to make sure you have the best funnest time on that trip like I want you to have a really fun trip I don't want this to be like a traumatizing trip you come back from you feel taken advantage of and like you never want to go back there again like I want you to come back and like want to scrapbook it yes (laughs) and like so I I just want to teach our kids like we don't even plan to teach our kids at all that there's like a god who's going to be upset if you do x y or z like that's just not how our brains think anymore like that was really the tipping point for david was like i just no longer believe in a petty god that's up there deciding what what matters and what doesn't coffee yes no uh, whatever you know so anyway i love like ranting no it's amazing it's so helpful being able to give kids like oh let's look at porn objectively and talk about what's good about it what's bad about it what it can do to your brain what it can do to your sexuality as opposed to like god will punish you for looking at porn and your wife will hate yeah you. And, and you're, you're gonna ruin gonna your marriage because what's that that's teaching them feel shame about it and hide it at all costs absolutely and that's just wrong which just perpetuates the shame cycle too yes. they're just gonna do it but they're gonna hide it better yes. absolutely i love all of that you said a lot of people asked in your question box about alcohol yes so let's talk about alcohol i think it's so funny and not like funny silly because i always wonder this too but i think people are always really curious about alcohol so curious. tell me about your alcohol journey If you have any tips and tricks, any alcoholic drinks you like, and we can end on the note of just the the alcohol post-Mormon thing. Some fun stuff, yeah. Well, I tried alcohol in high school, hated it. I don't think I ever really did it in college, actually. I just had kind of bad experiences in high school and was like, I don't think it's for me. So yeah, like I guess I always leaned on like, well, it's gross. I didn't have a good experience whatever because it really wasn't the church telling me not to have it I definitely am more on the rebellious side like that's not going to stop me so you just actually didn't like I it. just actually didn't yeah. like it but then it got to the point where once I was more open-minded with all of that stuff and kind of got rid of the idea that like there's a Satan trying to tempt me and all of that I think I really looked at alcohol or I started to notice more that like for couples, it was really bonding. Like they would, we have friends who drink wine at night and they just sit on the porch and drink wine and chat. And of course you can do that without alcohol. But then my aunt and my cousins, they'll go on these wine tasting tours together. I love that it can be a bonding thing that like brings people together. So yeah, me and David were like, okay, let's we want to be like social drinkers and like have those experiences. And when we're older, like go on wine tasting tours Mm -hmm. with the kids or whatever. So fun. Um, So we went to Italy and that's the first time we were like, okay, let's try some drinks together. So we would try different wines. We loved an Aperol spritz, Mm. which is hard not to love. I know. I just had my first one. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. It's been fun to like go out with friends. And it's funny. I was actually just with my investors at this conference and there were some other founders there and a couple of them have alcohol companies Mm -hmm. and hearing them speak about alcohol I was like wow I aspire to have that kind of passion about something like they would try something and be like oh I'm sensing a a pear undertone Mm -hmm. and like how they would describe it I'm like that is just really cool like for people I guess I always looked at it like this thing that Satan's tempting you to do and you party and you're irresponsible and like all these things and I'm like no it can actually just be like a really wholesome artistic 
Amen. Thing yes. that's like really fun. And yes. anyway, so I'm kind of just going at it from that perspective. Like I want it to be a fun bonding thing or be creative and like really think about it. Like what notes am I tasting and smelling and like just have a whole experience, you know? Yes. It's very artful. It it's, is. It's it really very is. artful. People are very passionate about it and it's so fun even as an adult to step into that world and realize, oh, there's this whole world. Coffee's kind of similar, right? Yes. There's a whole world of types of coffee and types of alcohol that are so fun to explore and to try and to realize it's actually this really beautiful culture around these substances. That's, yeah, not just crazy party culture. Yes. <laughs> and I just went to a friend's wedding and a bunch of friends of mine, we've never really gotten like drunk together since leaving the church and everyone got like pretty drunk and it was so special and so bonding. So, so bonding. Like people I've been friends with for 10 years that I'm like, I've never bonded with you in yeah, this way. Yeah. And it was really cool to be like, alcohol can be an amazing tool when used responsibly. It really can. And to be like, whoa, we got to have this like really fun, uninhibited just like dancing and laughing. Yes, just be silly. Yes. Especially like if you are more reserved, like I'm very reserved and I feel like it takes me a few times of hanging out with someone before they even like barely know my personality, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But I do think alcohol helps with that and like it has helped me a lot with overcoming that, I think, in those social experiences or situations, I mean. But yeah, I think it definitely can be used in like good ways and... You can still be a responsible adult. <laughs> exactly. You're not going to all of a sudden become an alcoholic or yes, get a DUI. Like totally. you can use it responsibly. And actually stepping into that world as an adult can be really nice because, yeah, I'm obviously more responsible now than I once was. And it's fun to be able to be like, oh, I can use this in a responsible way and in ways that actually enrich my life. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It, it does kind of work out good that like we're coming around to it now with mm -hmm. like our healthy routines and like the self-awareness and all of exactly. that. Exactly. It's like kind of the perfect time. I so agree. I agree. Fun. Okay. I feel like there's still so many more things I could ask you about and we didn't even touch on your business, which is so inspiring and so cool. There's always just, you know, Mormonism touches everything. So it's yeah. difficult to touch on everything that Mormon touches, but I am curious if there's anything else you want to speak to with your Mormon journey. I feel like you've spoken really beautifully to kind of where you're at now, but if there's any other words you wanted to share about kind of where you've landed and, and how it feels for you. I mean, I don't think so. We touched on most of it. I did write after life was like a big topic that like weighed mm. heavily on our minds. I just wrote a blog post about it. So anyone can go read that if they want to hear more. But yeah, I mean, I think it's just like kind of fun to navigate after it's like, it's just like a fun journey. So I'm like so excited that you are doing these interviews because it is really nice to connect with other people who are in similar situations. And like I was saying, like hear their beliefs and like maybe take on one of their traditions or something. So totally. I feel like we can all just kind of build our own like post Mormon routines and whatnot. Yeah. Which is fun. So I love that. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, one thing I wanted to tell you is a friend of mine, I think was like, Oh, you're interviewing Amber filler up. Are you nervous? And I was like, somehow just through the internet, I already feel very safe. I think oh, you have good. a very safe presence, even online, which is hard to do. You have a presence that feels very welcoming, very safe, very magical in that way you described. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet that I already feel that way about this oh human that I haven't even Thank met. You. And so I just want to say, I know that you're that for a lot of people. And I know that you stepping into post-Mormonism and doing it in the way that you're doing it is helping so, so, so many women. So thank you for doing that, for being brave, for paving a path for women to speak publicly about what's on their mind and what they're thinking and feeling. I think you are a huge part of the domino effect that's letting women like me feel like we can do that. So oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much for coming to Girls Camp. Of course. And thank you everyone for listening. Bye. G -I -R -L